Hello and welcome to Working Historians, a podcast series about what historians do with their lives. I am Rob Denning, the faculty lead for history at Southern New Hampshire University's Global Campus. Calling in from his West Coast base of operations is James Fennessy. Today we are talking to Dr. Christopher Chan, who is calling in from his upper Midwestern base of operations. Chris is a writer and adjunct instructor for history at SNHU. He is also a Master of Library Sciences, a student of modern urban economies, and a jack-of-all-trades historian. Today we will talk about his academic and professional background, his work with an internet startup, Agatha Christie, the academic job market, and a whole bunch of other topics. So what is your name and what do you do? Hi, my name is Chris Chan. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, this is just about five years, and now I believe I'm teaching my 30th class, give or take one, for Southern New Hampshire University in the graduate program. And I also work numerous different part-time jobs in my field, which I would would like to discuss today. Yeah, that sounds great, Chris. Uh, Before we get into what you're currently doing, let's talk a little bit about your background. So can you tell us a bit about your studies and how you first became interested in history, and then we can talk about where that's taken you. Absolutely. I first started getting interested in history at my um, high school, the University School of Milwaukee, which was this great school, and we had three excellent high school history teachers. So I had brilliant teachers for um, non-Western world, European history, American history, and um, special senior elective courses on the 1960s and um, American legal issues, which really got me interested in history. When I was in APU as history, my uh, high school teacher, uh, we call him JS, um, helped work with me on trying to develop my term paper to send it to this all high school student journal called the Concord Review. It was on abolitionist writers and how they affected public opinion. And even though it didn't get published, I just realized I really loved the writing process and the research aspects, and I really wanted to do more. So I went to Lawrence University in Appleton for my undergrad work, where I double majored in history and English and had a government minor. And when I was there, I um, worked a lot with the faculty, and they recommended I go to graduate school because I wanted to teach. And then I went to Marquette University in Milwaukee, started with my master's, and I got my master's in modern U.S. history, got my doctorate in U.S. history with my dissertation on um, mass consumption in Milwaukee during the 20th century. And then after, and since then, I've gotten from UW-Milwaukee my MLIS, my Masters of Library and Information Science in order to help um, research in public history as well. That's fantastic. I actually uh, know quite a few people who went on to get their MLIS after doing an undergrad in both English and history. So I think there was a there was a trend about, I don't know, between the last 10 and 15 years for people who realized that a master's in library science could really benefit them professionally. And it just sounds like an interesting program as well. Right, because when I got it from UWM, it's an all, you have the option of an all-online program. Or you, you can go, be, go in person, take classes, or you can do a combination if you want. And I just thought that given my work schedule, it was best to do it all online. So I, and I managed to get everything done in about 20 months. You start out taking... Again, I stress it's not just the library science. When you start coming, it's usually 12 courses for if, to get the MLIS, but if you already have a master's, you only need to take 10. Four are required courses on introduction to library information science, and then I took courses on uh, a couple on archives, on technology you use, on digital libraries, also on a um, one on the Search Engine Society, and another course in what's called infopreneurship, as where you work within an organization to help promote new um, business ideas. So I just found um, a lot of those, the elective courses, extremely interesting and helpful, and I wound up writing my um, capstone project on basically archive theft and how the 
how the federal government was has set up a special task force to track down stolen items from the National Archives because so much of um, American history, everything from signed presidential pardons, other documents, photos, every memorabilia has gone missing and probably stolen over the last uh, few decades. And I wrote about how there's a new committee just to help track down stolen items and so forth, which I found very interesting. Oh, wow. That sounds like it could be a great plot for a new Nicolas Cage movie. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that's what everybody <laughs> says when I mention that. Everybody's like, oh, you mean like National Treasure? And I think, well, <laughs> and I said, you know, it's not just like people breaking in and stealing the, the heavily guarded Declaration of Independence. The fact is, you've got like this one case. This one guy comes in, he's got a special coat with hidden pockets. He brings cupcakes. He was known for bringing sweet treats for all the archivists there. And then he would basically ask for all these boxes. And then he could stuff all these priceless documents into his pockets and so forth and walk out and sell them on the black market and everything. And all these other people who would take things. It's just um, amazing how poorly guarded a whole lot of these documents are and how there's a huge black market American mem history memorabilia all over the world and people from all these other countries are paying top dollar to have all these signed documents from major figures, other pieces of history, buying them, putting them in personal collections and no one ever sees them again. And we don't most basically we have no idea that a lot of the stuff is gone and it's because no one does an inventory do you remember was that uh was that person was that the sandy Berger case when uh, uh bill clinton's former national security advisor was walking out of the national archives with documents related to that were somewhat related to september 11th it might have been a different a different instance but that's that's one that i have to remember offhand that's not the only case, but that's one of the cases that I discussed where the story where basically he was stuffing all these um, documents in his socks one time and mm -hmm. hid them under a trailer. That's one, one of three big cases that I profiled. Huh, interesting. So I actually wanted to go back to your uh, dissertation also because you mentioned that it was on consumption in um, Milwaukee and one of my fields of interest is environmentalism, which is kind of t related to the idea of consumption and all that. So what was the overall argument in your dissertation? Well, my argument, the process of buying and selling helped to develop the city of Milwaukee. And I'm arguing that w while Milwaukee is a good example of the rise and fall of certain businesses throughout the country, it's also due to its initial infrastructure and business development and factory making during the mid early mid 20th century Milwaukee did have a very different path than a lot of other cities because as I look at mass consumption it's looking at three main different venues of research first is automobiles how automobiles were developed bought and sold from the early 20th century up to around the 1970s and again how Milwaukee was transformed by the sudden introduction of the private personal automobiles. And then the second one is on food stores, the development from the corner grocery store to the giant supermarket, and where I found some brilliant information, just how we shop, how everything changed, and how we as consumers, our relationship with our surroundings and the city changed as we learned more and more about the new design and the locations of our grocery stores. And finally, I, I finished it with other shopping venues, starting with anything from little local neighborhood stores to the department stores and going on to shopping centers and malls. And I flash forward a bit as I talk a lot about the rise and fall of the mall in Milwaukee life and how, as you can see now, there's been a lot more about that. And a few years after I finished the dissertation, there's been all these work, including um, popular layman work on the fall of the mall, the mall in American life, and what causes all these bustling community hubs to become deserted and abandoned over time. There's some excellent 
amateur documentaries that I love watching on the fall of the mall and the, all these business and so forth, which is exactly what I talk about in my dissertation. Yeah, there's been, like you said, I have seen a lot lately on like the demise of malls and all that. And I think there's even an old website called something like deadmalls.com or something where it's just people taking photographs of empty old malls and it's just really kind of depressing. There is indeed. I've seen that website too and this great, basically, I think he's a college student now, but his name is Jake Williams of Bright Sun Films who runs this great um, YouTube channel called Abandoned and a number of his short videos are on the fall of malls around the U.S. and Canada, also some of the big box stores and corporations that fell and were abandoned. And there's even other um, YouTube channels, too, that do tours of all these shopping malls. And I remember on the north side, there's basically Northgate and the malls in Milwaukee. There's one tour there of this abandoned mall, and you see everything. It's like some areas, like, the Walgreens that's been abandoned for years is like a relic of the 1970s because they never updated it or remodeled it. You see all these really old-fashioned looking things, and it's just as they tour around, you see it's sort of frozen time. And yeah, and the trajectory of the mall in American history is pretty fascinating. I grew up in outside of a small city in upstate New York, and I mean, the mall in the 80s was was kind of the center. It became a center for community. It became a center for high schoolers. It was just where people went. And I mean, you look back at 80s culture, you had pop stars that did tours of malls. I think it was Tiffany who was actually did a, you know, mall tours. And just how central the mall was to cons not only consumer culture, but also community in certain areas back in the 80s. And just watching that slowly die throughout the 90s and all of these shops closing up, you know, shuttering their doors. And then the different types of shops that have started to open in in the last 10 years and not only stores but like you're saying um, different services or or experiences it's it's really interesting to watch how the mall has uh, transformed from the 70s exactly as i was saying one of the things i learned is that there is a actual defined difference between the shopping centers and the malls because uh, for those people who don't know a shopping center is defined as a large collection of stores that, but to get from one to the other, you have to leave one, usually going outside, some, to, and then go to another. So, as you can see, there's a difference between you know, a shopping center where it's often underhanging, but you, you, we've all been to them where you go, the stores are not connected, at least access, in a way accessible to the customers. It's what would they sometimes yeah. call a strip mall? Yeah, oh, exactly. is that what that's you're going to say? That's what yeah. I was going to say, yeah, strip mall. <laughs> right. Well, there are some differences because strip malls can contain combinations, but yeah, this, that's what a shopping center is. But a mall is defined as an enclosed, climate-controlled collection of stores where you move from one to the other. So a whole big building is the place where everybody's supposed to go for shopping, food, and entertainment. Yeah, it definitely seems to be true that the shopping center model seems to be predominating. I mean, in I'm in Columbus, Ohio, and the pattern now seems to be that, you know, the the old malls wasn't, yeah, like you said, it was an enclosed space, and the anchor stores were always like the Sears, the Macy's, JCPenney, those types of places. But now it looks like the more successful shopping centers are the ones that are anchored by lower end, like you said. So we're talking, you know, Target, Walmart. Kohl's, those are kind of now the new anchor stores for shopping centers, and so they'll be surrounded by a whole bunch of other stores, but they aren't all enclosed in one big building. They just all have their storefronts along the parking lot kind of thing. So it, it is an, it, it, I do see that trend playing out even around me here. And as I point out many times in my dissertation, that the whole, I mean, it's one thing to have a shopping center in a place like L.A. or Miami, but when you have some place like Milwaukee, where you've got 20 below wind chills on a good day in January and constant rain and snow throughout the year, that's why there's definitely a need sometimes for completely enclosed shopping or, and again, um, basically parking garages with shelter from the elements. Yeah, <laughs> same thing here in Ohio. I, I, whenever I go shopping in January or February, I kind of miss the old malls because it does get really cold out there. We don't have that problem in San Francisco. Yeah, whatever. 
<laughs> anyway, so Chris, you mentioned at the beginning of all this that you have used your history degrees in a variety of jobs and part-time jobs and all that. So uh, why don't you start telling us a little bit about those? What kind of jobs have you found and what and how have those jobs used your history degrees? All right, yeah, because to be honest, ever since I got my PhD, I've been looking for good full-time work. But, you know, it's a very difficult job market. And so over the years, I've been finding, you know, one job after another that I get, I'm able to do all my work from home remotely. So, and I have a very, for the most part, a very flexible schedule allowing me to, uh, you know, set my own times and make appointments for other things as needed. But for the last few years, this is a job that I always knew would n not be permanent. But it's working for a new tech company called Bubble Up. And Bubble Up, it's basically a form of organizing your information that you find on the Internet. I got the job because they were looking, when I was getting my MLIS, they were looking for graduate students with a background in research to help them track and do some research on the Internet, tracking news and stories research. So I got hired for that and and over the past four years my um, work has expanded I've been able to do mo more for them and it's been a great job as I've learned a lot I've been in fact I have all these ideas for writing essays about the news what we know how news stories change how I mean my dissertation advisor father Stephen Avella always used to say that newspapers are the first draft of history and when we look online, stories that are constantly changed, updated, refuted, and the old stories are more accessible, but even when they're not updated or changed to reflect the fact that, oh, but when a week later people say, oh, by the way, everything we did was wrong, but, you know, the old stories, sometimes they're scrubbed from the Internet, sometimes they're not. And I've just learned so much by tracking all sorts of news, details, and everything from information on various sorts of the varying levels of reliability. I mean, it's not just what we call fake news. It's also fake information as well on the Internet. And it's just fascinating just to track just how – it's like this one comment that I've heard before that I think is so accurate, how we have the Internet, but so few people really understand it. It's just this wondrous combination of information – misinformation, entertainment, and so much that can do so much to educate us, and yet the average individual uses it for pornography and cat pictures. And that's just a, you know, <laughs> it's, yeah, and it's, it, as I said, I think what Marshall McLuhan did for television in the 1960s, we need to have more people do for the Internet right now because – I, this working for Bubble Up has just completely matured and expanded the way I look at how we get our information from the inf internet. And my interest in again public history, information science, really, it's made me think a lot about everything. The um, Bubble Up is going public, so my work there over the last few months, it's I haven't had as much to do, and pretty soon I think my work will end there. So I'm looking for something else, but. Now, I've had a lot of other jobs. My favorite is working for Agatha Christie Limited as a researcher and what's called them. Um, they gave me the, this. I love this title. If you excuse me for being in love with my own job title, but an international goodwill ambassador. Basically, I'm a huge Agatha Christie fan. I've been since I was ten, one since I was 10. And I've read all of her mysteries. Since then, there's been other plays and um non-mystery novels have been released since then, which I've read. And back in about 2005, they launched a new website. I started posting a lot, and then it became clear that I had a much more comprehensive graph of her work than pretty much anyone else they knew, including people who worked there, not to boast. I'm just saying that I kind of have an encyclopedic memory for her work. So after a while, they hired me as a consultant and asked me to write some papers for them and and now the whole thing with being an international goodwill ambassador is that I use social media to reach out to fans, make connections around the world and that's another thing I've been researching, just how fandom and how international cultural phenomena can 
bring people together. And I think that as we're looking, you know, you've got all these colleges looking at things like um, peacemaking or um, international connections. I think that what we really need to do, if not just for things like um, international relations and so for, and peacemaking, for if I'm saying that business schools using marketing, advertising, and I think as we look at cultural studies, we need to look at uh, international phenomenon because things like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, Narnia, other, there's only, I'm Sherlock Holmes, there's only a, a handful of both literary phenomena that unite the whole world, also franchise everything from Star Trek, Star Wars, Doctor Who, and others as well. But I don't think nearly enough research has been done on how these franchises and fandom can be used to unite people from so many other different backgrounds and how it can be used not just for business, but also for diplomacy, looking at psychology, understanding the mass media. And I just think that this is something that um, we need to spend more time studying in order or to really understand what how the world has changed, especially in the wake of just the past 20 years of how the Internet and then the past decades, social media has changed everything. So this is a case where my interest in history, my interest in literature, is I think is going to be a very important part of our new discussion of technology, the digital age, interconnections, if we speak up and make it a part, because a lot of people aren't thinking about it, but I think it's critical to how we understand the age of um, the Internet, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and so forth, because what we know, how we connect to people, what we think of them is changing dramatically. That's awesome that you were able to parlay your interest in that topic into something that's actually a paying job. I mean, that's <laughs> I, I'm a fanboy about all kinds of things, and it would be really cool to get paid for that kind of stuff. So I'm impressed that you were able to... Uh, Again, it's, it sounds like it's a part-time thing, but it sounds like, but that's really cool that you're able to contribute to it in that way. And you may have kind of much larger consequences of that. Like you're saying, it can be can play out in whole whole new new ways with new technologies and new ways of reaching out to people and all that. So that's that's really cool that you're doing that. What else have you been up to your degree? I've also been I'm getting a lot written in various uh, departments. I've had some of my other jobs. I I'm a contributing editor for the magazine Gilbert, and I write reviews for the Strand magazine. I just may have got another gig at a Crime Spree magazine writing reviews. When I started college, I thought I did my due diligence, but there wasn't that much on the academic situation online. But when I was apl first applied for grad school, all these people at my college and elsewhere were telling me that I, we were on the cusp of a boom time for hiring especially in fields like history. And they were telling me if I wanted to stay in Milwaukee, I would almost certainly be able to find a really good job at one of the colleges in Milwaukee because they, they were saying this is a point where they were hiring more and more faculty in the coming years, and I should be ready for it. And I mean, when I got my master's and started my Ph.D. at Marquette, there were so many jobs posted, and pretty much everyone in the program got a really good job at a college or university as far as I knew. So I thought, well, I'll get started. And so I got my master's. And then after I finished my, it was about 2008. That was, as you probably know, what they call the Great Recession was starting. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden we went from having hundreds of jobs, maybe over 300 jobs at least, you know, just around, hearing around. Suddenly there were fewer and fewer all of a sudden, not only are there so few jobs, all of a sudden, but hardly any of them are tenure track anymore. We went from having a bull market to a bear market in just less than five years, as far as we knew. And I know people say it's always been difficult, but that's not really always the case. It's not always been as difficult. So it's uh, the whole the adjunctification of academic life is going to say interesting because. This is the most polite word I have for it right now. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, and 
my cousins are in a different industry, and you you probably see this in you know working with a tech company as well. It's you know it's not just higher ed. It seems to be the the transition in the current job market, at least in the last ten years, where you know now everybody within the tech industry who knows how to code, like coders are a dime a dozen. So what they end up getting are contract positions, much like our adjunct positions, where no no company really puts forward full-time positions anymore. They're, they're constantly working through recruiting agencies or offering people contracts because when you offer somebody a contract, most of the time uh, you don't have to offer benefits and you know you don't have to make a long-term commitment to anybody. And it's just, you know, I see these these trends occurring elsewhere in the job market as well. So we're kind of suffering from the same issues in higher ed as a number of industries are right now. The the term for it that everybody uses is the gig economy, that we're moving into a new type of thing where relatively few people, well, I mean, they always kind of disagree on this, the statistics and all of that. I mean, the, we still have in, in the U.S. and around the world, we still have a majority of people are employed full time, but we are seeing a trend towards more part-time jobs, and that's going to start affecting other industries that were previously seemed to be immune to those types of market shifts. And I know the academic part well, <laughs> just like Chris does. I entered, <laughs> I entered my uh, PhD program at Ohio State back in 2005 when everything was going really well. And so for the first two years of my grad school experience, all the other older, not older, but, you know, the senior grad students uh, that were close to graduating or were graduating, they were all getting snapped up left and right. And so things were looking really, really cool. And then, yeah, 2008 happens and then everything falls apart. And so by 2011, when I graduated, uh, we're pretty much into this, the world that Chris was describing where there's very there, – there are still tenure jobs out there, but each of those jobs is going to receive, you know, 300 applications and so the odds of getting one of those jobs are very, very small. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, the vast majority of people have ended up in these in part-time adjuncts or multiple employers doing multiple types of careers, kind of like what Chris is doing. They're finding a bunch of different part-time positions to kind of piecemeal together into a full-time salary almost, hopefully, or people working full-time in something completely outside of history and just teaching part-time or something to try to keep their – satisfy the the history itch, um, even if they're not able to do it full-time. But, yes, that's – I know that story well <laughs> is what I'm getting at. <laughs> I, and, again, I, I think I'm, you were just – you brought up exactly what I want, was going to say about the gig economy because I kind of hate that term because I think that sounds like sort of a marking term trying to make – the current job situation sound hip and cool. Oh, yeah, right? definitely. <laughs> because I like to call it the gag economy because that's what it essentially puts a stranglehold on a lot of people's futures. I mean, how can you get you know a mortgage or raise a family when you never know for sure what your – I mean, not just from year to year, but from month to month what your income is going to be like? So, uh, Chris, what do you have to recommend to our audience today? I would like to mention this new book by Dorothy Market, and it's called With One Shot, Family Murder and a Search for Justice. It's a new book that just came out in March of 2018, but it's a true crime story about the murder of a local sh- police officer in a rural Wisconsin called Laverne Stordock. He was a well-respected guy, but although he had a bit of a scandal in his personal life, when he left his wife and daughter and remarried this one woman who had been divorced one day. He was shot and killed in his own home, and his second wife, Suzanne, confessed the crime, said that she had been abused and was had a mental breakdown. She wound up getting just about 10 or 11 months in a mental hospital and then was released, and then she inherited his estate, got his insurance, policy, his daughter and his ex, first ex-wife, which, as it turned out, Laverne was in the process of trying to leave his second wife, Suzanne, and reunite with his first wife because his second marriage wasn't working out and his first wife was still in love with him. So he was trying to reunite his family when he was killed. Once Suzanne was released from the mental hospital, she got all his money and then went on to marry again. Had a pretty successful life after that, and then, and his daughter tried to sue the insurance company for the the money and lost. Dorothy Markick, who about 50 years after the murder, she's she's working as a dramatist and college professor now. She starts digging into the case. She thinks 
that Suzanne got away with murder, but not exactly. But she didn't actually fire the gun. Dorothy F- Markick figures out who believes she figures out who did it because she spent two years reading. I just think it's absolutely fascinating because again, she's not a professional historian, but she's an amateur who she taught her t- learning historical research. You get it's a good look at how historical research plays out. There's also more being essentially a private detective as well. So I think this is a very interesting look at how historical research and everything applies to real-world situations and the importance of it. A comparable book on Wisconsin history on um, Mark Lemberger's Crime of Magnitude, about another true crime case where the traditional solution was he was able to prove it to his satisfaction to be false and pointing out that how everybody's been blaming the wrong guy for the murder for, for almost a, a century. Moving aside from true crime, I do want to um, once again mention Bright Sutton Films, Jake Williams, the, and this short um, YouTube abandoned video series are these great mini documentaries on the rise and fall of businesses, different business plans, a lot of history, everything we talked about the, from the decline of Blockbuster to how Disneyland um, never got to build certain parks. It's a very good look at contemporary American history, business, and culture. And I think that anybody who wants to do more public history and would be adv- advised to use these as templates for a little, uh, if you want to start your own YouTube channel or make short documentaries, that's definitely a good uh, source to look at there. That sounds really cool. All right, James, what do you have for us this time? All right. Well, my recommendation today is about a documentary series by Steve James. Uh, You might recognize the name. He did Hoop Dreams back in the 90s. And basically, he went back to his hometown of Chicago High School, Oak Park, which is um, rumored or supposed to be a very liberal and integrated school in Chicago. And James has wanted to investigate race relations at this at this high school because what he was seeing and some of the things that he discovered was that while it was very inclusive, while it has a mixed population and everybody seems to, to get along and have the same benefit from the same advantages, that the white experience uh, was very different from the black experience. So you have these white students who feel as though they belong and they feel that this is a natural place for them whereas you still have um, some black students that don't feel that that still feel alienated that feel like this isn't necessarily the place for them that maybe they're just extremely lucky to be there Um, so I think it's a 10-part series I haven't had a chance to watch it yet but I've been doing a lot of research on it and it seems like it's going to be a pretty good look into not only race relations in America and in American high schools but also race relations in areas that are self-professed as liberal and what that means. So are some of the racial issues really invisible to good-meaning white people who see themselves as being part of this very open-minded or what they consider open-minded community, whereas the the realities of the experiences of um, some people of color might not actually reflect that belief. Interesting. If you ever, you know, find that streaming for free somewhere, let me know. That sounds really cool. Definitely. You don't want to get a subscription to Stars just to watch this documentary? A few weeks ago, my son was playing around with the Amazon. We have one of those Amazon Fire Sticks. We can watch Amazon shows through the TV. And he was mm-hmm. goofing around with that. And he subscribed me to Stars. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I had great. To go so back. just go back and watch it right now before you... <laughs> well, luckily I got it canceled. But I mean, I had seven days before they charged my card. And uh, so I, I luckily got in there in time because I don't even know what their subscription fees are. But yeesh. <laughs> So wow. he, 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 got a, he got a little bit of a, a talking to about using daddy's credit cards. Anyway, <laughs> um, my recommendation is a new book that is actually kind of relevant to the conversation that we were having earlier, the stuff that Chris was talking about with kind of the difficulties of the historical profession with becoming – with being taken seriously, I suppose. And there's a, a new book out by Sam Weinberg called Why Learn History, parentheses, when it's already on your phone. I haven't actually read the full book yet. I've just read excerpts of it online. And in some ways, it's kind of uh, – the story's kind of been told before. In this case, he's actually blaming historians for our current – a lot of our current travails, whatever you want to call it, because historians have not done a very good job keeping up with 
the culture and the new technologies and all of that. Historians tend to be kind of backward looking or they tend to be fairly conservative when it comes to using online documents, online resources, that kind of thing. And so this guy is basically saying that historians need to get with the times. And, and he makes kind of some other general comments on the state of history education in the country. And there's always a fear that we and you know people outside of history have that the younger generations aren't learning history as well as their parents did or their grandparents or whatever there's always kind of this idea that back in the day everybody learned history really well and we're just not doing it very well anymore and part of the book is all about now that's not true kids learn history at pretty much the same rate now that they ever did in the past the general you know surveys and all that have kind of laid out the idea that you know what it's there are really no changes but the new issue that is going to be facing historians according to the Weinberg is that one of our challenges is to train people to be able to discern fake news fake materials versus real news real materials there's kind of a critical thinking gap that we need to start filling because he cites surveys about people who can't discern a fake article or a biased article from a serious article that is unbiased. So there, there's difficulties there that historians need to figure out how we can fix. And that's one way that we will become relevant is by teaching people to become better, better critical thinkers through the study of history. And again, we've heard this before. And from what I've seen, he doesn't have a whole lot of solutions to that, which is one of the things that always kind of frustrates me about these types of books. But he says that he is working on some sort of an online lesson plans that can be shared that might help with, with all of this. So anyway, one of the things that kind of came out of this is that he challenges a lot of the standard practices that history teachers and college professors use. And one of the targets for him is the use of the, the Howard Zinn book, A People's History of the United States. This is a, kind of a small part of the book, but I'm just focusing on it because this is an excerpt that I, that I just finished reading and it was kind of interesting. But basically he makes the argument that the People's History of the United States is just as bad as a lot of the textbooks that came before it because it relies only on secondary sources. It doesn't involve very much uh, primary source research. It doesn't cite sources. Which is true, but at the same time, these are the same arguments that have been made about the, the Howard Zinn book since it was published. I think this author is kind of missing the point that a lot of other people have missed when they can critique the people's history of the United States. When you put aside the obvious ideological bias that's in the middle of that book, which is, you know, some people like, some people don't, the book is still important even without that, because at the time in 1980, when it was written, there just wasn't anything like this. There wasn't much of a focus on the underdog or minorities or gender or focusing on the working man instead of the capitalists and all of that. There had been some, but it wasn't done in a popular format like this. And so I think that when people start complaining about the Howard Zinn book, Yes, from a modern perspective, it's, it doesn't feel very radical because we talk about this stuff all the time now. But I just wanted to kind of put in my two cents to remind people that, you know, back in 1980, when this thing was first published, this was radical. This was new and it excited a lot of people. And I think it deserves to have some of the lasting excitement that people have had from it. And so it still pops up in classrooms all the time. And I think that's fine. It's always a good idea to balance it, of course. You don't want to just focus on that book because just like with any other field, it's kind of foolish and intellectually suicidal to focus on just one book for your entire life. You want to you want to put it in context with a whole lot of other books also. But I just want to cast my vote out there that I like that book. It's again, I think it's it's not perfect and it does have all those all those problems that he points out and other critics point out all are true with the sourcing and the citations and all of that. But for what it is and for when it was published, I think it is a very important book. And so I, I do not think we should just cast it aside like he and others have called for. So that's my rant. <laughs> all right. So, I uh, <laughs> agree. I'm looking at my weathered copy of Zinn on my bookshelf right now. Nice, nice. Everyone should have at least one. Well, thank you, Chris, for joining us today. Yes, thank you, Chris. This was a fantastic conversation. And thank you all for joining us today. If you have any questions or comments on this podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please shoot me an email at workinghistorians at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at filibusterhist. For James Fennessy and Chris Chan, I am Rob Denning. Have a good day. <laughs>